I am an extremely passionate and committed human services professional who possesses an in-depth working knowledge of the psychological and sociological aspects of human development. I consider myself to be a cognitive behavioral specialist, believing that making a change in how one thinks brings about a change in what one does. Many shy away from therapy because they feel their situations are either unique or they are fearful, embarrassed, or ashamed to let others know they need help. SciSpot is my way of corralling pertinent personal, professional, and academic information on understanding human development in one place for all to access privately and even share with others. My personal mission statement is, I am driven by divine precepts and an undying passion to facilitate change in the lives of others. What's yours? Let SciSpot guide you through your healing and provide you with many other ways of becoming better today than you were yesterday. Come on in and join me. And good morning. Welcome to SciSpot. I'm your host as always, your man, Sabir Aline. It is a great day in Riviera Beach, Florida. Uh, feels like it's about uh, maybe 75, 76 degrees with an expected 80 degree temperature. So y'all know I'm hitting the beach uh, right after the show. Flip-flops are at the door waiting for me. I'm ready to go. Chair is already in the trunk. So that's my twist for the day. It's always my twist. That's why I moved here to Florida to be on the beach as much as I possibly can. Right, I'm an outdoors person. So, you know, the, the outdoors, the sunshine is stimulating, you know, for thought, uh, for the spirit, right? It kind of, you know, gets the juices flowing on ideas, you know, for different um, projects that I'm working on. It's a real good place for me to kind of settle, you know. Um, listen, I didn't see you last week. I missed you guys. Uh, I tried desperately to uh, to go on uh, with the show, but I didn't have any idea how long the uh, the IT updates were going to take. And you know, it took about three or four hours. Um, I use my laptop often, but I usually have it off most of the time because I'm at work. And when I come home, I'm I'm usually on my phone more than anything. So my computer really doesn't get a chance to do the updates. Even though it, it's set on automatic updates, uh, for some reason it doesn't always do that. So, uh, very extensive updates, a lot of new features on the computer, a uh, lot of new things for me to play with and experiment with, because I'm always doing that. You know, I've always, even as a child, experimented with uh, doing things. I used to take things apart, I used to get beat for doing it, but I took them apart because I was curious. I always talk about the incident where I actually set a G.I. Joe uh, doll on fire. Uh, and I got my behind whooped for it because I had not long ago gotten it. And um, I didn't pay for it. So my mother asked me, uh, she told me she asked me, she said, well, what, like, what were you thinking? What? What's wrong with you? I said, well, he was in a war, right? The influence of television, you know, and, and imagination uh, can really take you a long way. Um, and, and those are the things that reside within us, uh, that curiosity, you know, the, the wantingness of, of more, uh, to learn more, to, to see and do more. And that's always been part of my character. I enjoy learning. So when I do these shows, um, whatever shows I do, if I do a workshop, if I do a training, um, if I do a lecture, uh, whatever it is, I'm always learning. And that's one of the biggest deficiencies with service providers, individuals who provide direct care, individuals who provide customer service, right? Uh, what, whatever it is that you're doing, you know, you, you get the job, you get the degree, and that's the extent, that's the extent of your learnings. You know, I subscribe to um, uh, different uh, like Psychology Today and 
you know, uh, SAMHSA and, and a host of others. I subscribe to them because I get new information and I'm always reading the information and internalizing the, uh, the information and learning how to apply it. Learning how to apply it. And that's real important. It's real important that we're always polishing up our craft because I want to be as proficient and as efficient as I possibly can to provide the best service possible. And I do that in, in my personal life. These shows, when I read this information and I regurgitate this information, and I apply this information to my own personal life, it helps me grow and develop. It helps me see, you know, who I really am. And that's important to understand. It is. Uh, and oftentimes what people are doing is uh, we're growing up. And I'm not talking about adulthood. I'm just talking about growing up. And we're growing up in very painful existences. And we're not bringing those things in, you know, to resolve. We're, we're carrying those things. Uh, it brings to mind the the song uh, by Erica Badu, Bag Lady, and, you know, the Nickel Bag Lady, and, uh, you know, the Hoochie Mama Lady. Well, I don't remember the words verbatim. I can go back and find them. But there's different bags we're all carrying around. So there's not just a bag lady. There are bag men, bag boys, bag, uh, uh, it's just baggage. And we all have it. We all have it. We all have some baggage that we are dragging, right, through our lives. But we have to see what it is that we're doing to lighten the load. But the only way you can see how to lighten the load is you have to see the load that you're carrying. You have to see the load that you're carrying. So the previous shows have been addressing trauma and taking a look at childhood trauma specifically. Specifically, because childhood trauma is what forms our world view. It forms our perception and our perspective of, of, of everything. What we eat, you know, uh, how we in interact with others, gender specific uh, uh, in most cases, right? How I interact with a, the male, the dominant male in my family, the leader, so called, if, if I will. Um, uh, in, in the family, you know, all these perceptions are formed right in the environment where we are primarily raised. That's where our mind, you know, begins to form in our perceptions and our self-concept. See, there's so much that goes on in learning and we often miss that. Because as we begin to get older and focus on what it is that we think we need in our lives, we lose sight of those things you know, that we really need. Because our need, right, becomes uh, something that's more um, satisfying to the id. And I always talk about the id, the ego, and the superego, and I'm going to continue to do that. The id is that part of the self that never changes. The id is that part of the self that, that happens, at that first spark of life. That first spark of life, right? When the egg and the sperm connect that first spark, the id is there. And it, it remains there in the same condition from conception to death. It is unwavering from its own desire to satisfy itself by any means that it possibly can. Even if that means hurting somebody else. And it's not intentional hurt all the time, uh, but it's what the id does. So when you start looking at the shaping and the forming of a child's value system, of a child's belief system. It does not come on the heels of beatings. Let me be very clear on that, because I'm gonna also do a show on abuse, so we can really see the impact that beatings, that spankings, has upon a child. It satisfies the parent, because the parent feels that they have ceased the behavior of the child that they're addressing through that beating. But what you have done is created a whole nother condition, hence the reason why we have children's services, you know, uh, the DCFs, the DHSs, and whatever it is that they have, you know, in your state. That's why those things came into play. 
And as much as people want to keep riding on, well, you know, it worked for me. You know, I, you know, shit, I got my mom walked down and do it again. No, you didn't do it again. You thought about doing it again. And even though you didn't do it again with that particular person, maybe, you still continued to think about that thing. Right? You still continue to think about it. It wasn't addressed. See, discipline and punishment are two different things. Right? When you're beating, you're punishing. That's not discipline. Right? It's not discipline. And I do a show on punishment versus discipline as well. Right? So you need to begin to see those things because that's trauma. That is trauma. Any, just think about it for a minute. Anytime anybody has put their hands on you in any capacity, if somebody has struck you, slapped you, punched you, you've had a car accident, um, some, you know, even if someone accidentally uh, hits you with a shopping cart in the market, right, and they hit you on the back of the foot, and says, that happens a lot, people be behind you and they're leaning on a cart and talking, and they hit you on the back, you remember that. So what you tend to do is, when you, every time you're in the supermarket, you make sure there's a, a, an adequate amount of space between you and that other person because you keep thinking about it. When you see somebody creeping up on you with their cart, you know, you start looking back because you remember. You remember getting hit on the back of your foot with somebody's cart and how, how that hurt. Well, children, remember the beating. Now, how it plays out is a whole different a whole different discussion to have, but it plays out in a number of ways with each individual, right? So the last show, we were talking about, uh, we, were, we wrapped up with number four, the signs and symptoms of unresolved trauma. And it's from the, 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 the healthyplace.com website, right? So we were talking about signs and symptoms of unresolved trauma, right? The, the article is titled 15 Common Signs of Unresolved Trauma, right? That's the title of the article, and the article is written Friday, June the 10th, 2016, by, I hope I'm pronouncing this correct, Jemai Delo, Jamie, it could be Jamie Delo, uh, if I'm pronouncing it incorrect, please correct me. Um, I'm doing my best. I want to make sure I get the credit where credit is due, though, for the article. That, that's most important. I mean, you can mess up somebody's name, but when you don't give credit where credit is due, that in itself is a travesty. So we, we went over, let me just rehash the, the first ones we went over. We went over number one being a sign and symptom of the childhood trauma, anxiety or panic attacks that occur in what would be considered normal situations. Number two on that list, a feeling of shame, an innate feeling that they are bad, worthless, or without importance, right? Number three on that list was suffering from chronic or ongoing depression. Number four, uh, and this is where we stop, uh, practicing avoidance of people, places, or things that may be related to the traumatic event. Uh, this also can include an avoidance of unpleasant emotions. Right now, uh, so I'm going to pick up there um, because this is this is this is a a, a point uh, for a lot of relationships, um, and I kind of want to tie it into Freud's statement of. Uh, young adulthood not ending until the age of 39 years old. Now I just want you to kind of bear that in mind, right? So if you are 39 and under, Floyd's belief, Floyd, think about Mayweather now, Freud's belief is that um, this is the age of young adulthood. So many believe in that uh, young adulthood is like 18, and maybe going to, you know, 24, 25, somewhere in there. Freud said, no, it goes to 39. You're a young adult until you're, you're 39 years old. So now, young and adult, right, implies two different things, right? Because this is saying that you still have your, your youthfulness and not in your, just in your physical presence. 
right? Not just in your physical being, but you still have that youthfulness in your character, in your conduct, right? So along the way, you should be learning things, right? Uh, you should be becoming uh, uh, a little more learned. You should become more wiser in what it is that you're doing with your life. And sometimes that doesn't always mean having to do with the internal stuff. It, it, for, for most, it has to do with the, the external stuff. You know, my accomplishments, my achievements, you know, my baby having years, my marrying years, my college years, um, my career goals, things of that nature, you know, because that's what we tend to be groomed to think of first, as opposed to our spiritual conditioning first and foremost, right? We get taken into church, but we're not being taught to church. We're being taken into the, the masjid, the mosque, but we're not being taught it. And being taught it is much different than being taken to and exposed to an environment. It's a big difference. So when you start looking at the grooming process, right, you, you have to begin to look at, um, and I lost my train of thought because I thought about something else, but when you, you start looking at childhood functioning, when you start looking at uh, what happened between you and the parent, was there a bond between you and your parent and par or parents when born? If not, what did that do to your feeling of independence, your feeling of, uh, uh, a connectedness to the outside world because it's, it's a dangerous place you know for even us as adults you know who can uh, make decisions and protect ourselves in, in, in most cases as opposed to a child who cannot child doesn't have a, an infant doesn't have that ability it's our responsibility as parents to protect um, uh, our children and to groom them and protecting is not just with the nine millimeter you have sitting under the pillow. Protecting also means protecting their minds, right? Giving them information, right? giving them information, you know, that's pertinent to their continued growth and development. These things are really important and we lose sight of that sometimes because we're always focused on the external stuff. So. When you begin to come into the age of going to school, right, uh, that's where relationships are formed. You know, 76% of relationships that are formed um, in the workplace turn, turn out to be people, people hook up in the workplace, in the school environment, because you're spending more time in those environments than you are at home. So those relationships, right, based on the, the, the child's self-concept, the child's self-perception, the value system, you know, of relationships, those things begin to play out in the school, in the classroom. So you, you, you have a whole lot of things that start taking place. So by the time you get into the, you know, the years of pursuing marriage and the years of uh, going to college and the years of pursuing personal goals and aspirations and all those kind of things, You've already formed that. It's already formed. So once you already form something, right, now you begin to solidify it, you begin to reinforce it, right? So that means you put yourself around people who think like you, who do like you, who act like you, you know, who, you know, live in a certain area, who speak in a certain manner, who, you know, have similar aspirations. You begin to gravitate more towards those people right, wrong, or indifferent, but that's what you gravitate toward, right? That's what you're going to be gravitating toward. So you've already formed a sense of self. Now, the internal stuff is already formed as well. And this is, this is what makes, this is what makes, this, this is what makes, um, uh, engaging in, in personal relationships much more different and difficult because once you form that sense of self and somebody else enters into your life who does not have uh, the similar sense of self right this is where your conflict begins right because you like each other you, you're attracted to each other but your attraction to that person is based on an idea in some cases, an ideal uh, way of living. 
And when I say ideal, anytime you hear me say ideal, I'm referring to a, a, a an ascribed uh, um, conditioning such as religion, right? Culture. I'm look, looking at those kind of things. So for me, you know, it's a matter of religion. So I'm looking for somebody who, you know, has a foundation in God. You know, somebody who, you know, um, values uh, marriage, you know, uh, because that's the conversation we'll be having if, if this is one of those relationships that I feel is heading that direction. No, we, we know we have relationships with others that are much different than that. They're sexual relationships, they're chance encounters, they're, they're different things. But when you start looking at uh, solidifying a relationship, you know, with someone who you want to spend an ample amount of time with, whether it's a long-term relationship or the intention of marriage, you have to look at these things because these things start playing out. Um, in my soon-to-be released book, Why Are You My Ex, I talk a lot about uh, things that attract us to others and why we're attracted to particular people. And until we realize and accept uh, why we're doing what we're doing with these relationships, we will continue to enter into the same types of relationships. Now, if it's a good relationship that you've entered into, that's that's fine. But if you find yourself in strained relations with uh, with partners, then you want to start looking at yourself, right? And this is what this whole trauma thing ties into. And you know, number four, like I said, number four is probably the biggest one on this list because we begin to avoid painful situations. And this is what it talks about in number four. So what happens is when you're faced with certain things in that relationship, right, that are uncomfortable, that make you feel uncomfortable, it's nothing that the other person is doing. But the first thing we do is we attribute it to that person and we begin to form uh, some disdain, some resentment, you know, some um, uh, some other negative emotions toward that person when it's not that person. It is you reliving your own, your own trauma, right? But you don't realize it. You don't realize it. Because as I talked about before, one of the things that happens with uh, significant events, traumatic events, they stay within. And the, 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 the body protects itself. So that significant event will actually be stuffed into the confines of the mind, right? But what happens is it continues to send a signal. Your body sends a signal to the brain, right? Your brain sends a signal to the mind. And then these, all these signals get sent throughout, throughout your body, letting you know something is happening. And you don't know what's happening. You just know something is happening. You're feeling uncomfortable. You're getting anxious. You're getting irritated. You're getting... You know, whatever it is that the signals that you're getting, you're reacting to it. And you're reacting to this person in that circumstance. And you're thinking, you're feeling like it's that person. And what that person is actually doing is tri triggering that which exists within you. But you don't see it from that perspective. You don't. And you begin to blame that person. And you begin to tell that person it's their fault that, that you're feeling a particular way. You begin to tell that person uh, things about themselves, you know, because hurt people hurt people. So you begin to say things to that person. That, and it's not even relevant to that person. It's you. It's you. And then when they're, when, when conversation, when the intent to have conversation about what happened begins to take place, all it is, it, all it's going to be is defensiveness. Because you don't want to experience that feeling. So what you are experiencing in the moment is anger, relevant to the trauma, but what you're doing is you're making that person in front of you, the target, the target. Now you've targeted me for you feeling uncomfortable and you want to tell yourself that it's me doing this to you. I'm making you feel this way. I'm making you feel this way. And it's not me who is making you feel this way. It is me who has triggered something that exists within you that you need to bring resolve to. And when I say bring resolve to, I, it doesn't go away. Let me remind you over and over and over again. Trauma never goes away. You learn how to manage it. 
you learn how to manage it. You stop allowing it to control and run your life. Period. And what we have is a whole lot of significant events that dictate the course of relationships because people don't bring resolve to these things. They don't confront these things. They don't go to, they don't go to counseling. They keep trying to fix it their way. Um, number five on the list, flashbacks, nightmares, and body memories regarding the traumatic event. Now, you can always, you can, you can kind of figure out what flashbacks and nightmares are like. That's a reliving in the mind. You know, the mind is reliving the event. But I was just talking about body memories. And that's how I, I, I was relating the, the feelings that happen inside of you that you just are not conscious of. You know, you're not conscious of it. And, and these things are happening inside of you and you're reacting. That's a body memory, right? That's why I said the body protects itself automatically. The body protects itself. So these body memories, right, are doing what they do. They're doing what they do. And you have no idea what they're doing. Because in, in, in your, your, your mind, you're telling yourself. See, this is not what the mind is telling you. The mind, you know, is doing what it's supposed to do. The brain has been sending you signals telling you. You're feeling uncomfortable. But you don't know why you're feeling uncomfortable. But if you sit by yourself and you feel that discomfort, what do you do then? Because I'm not in front of you now. That person is not in front of you now. But you still have the same feeling. So what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm going to let that person go. I'm going to stop messing with them. I'm going to stop seeing that person because when I'm with that person, that's the only time I feel that. That's the only time I feel is when I'm with that person. So here I am now, I'm still thinking about it, still in my mind. I'm still feeling, my body is still reacting. So if my body is still reacting, right, what's happening? This is something that, this, 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 this person is, is, is interrupting my spirit. They're disruptive to my spirit. They're disruptive to the foundation of my spirit. You know, sometimes you have to be shook. You know, sometimes you have to have that jarring experience in your life for you to realize the need to change. The need to change. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to change partners. You have to move from the person you're with and, you know, start with somebody else because you're, you're going to always take you with you. But then you find yourself in the same situation you did before. So the information is not new at all. The signal that you're receiving inside is not new at all. It's not new. So you make another change. Somewhere along the line, you have to stop making these changes. You have to stop reliving the event. You have to go through the motion. So you have to relive in the moment with a professional. So you relive the entire event from the beginning to the end. And the beginning is not from the point of when the incident happened but from where you were in your life at the time. Because the, in the incident was significant for a reason. So it's about what were you doing in that day? Where were you going? What was, what was the plan for that day? Who were you with? All those different things. And then you're going to talk about the event. So you want to talk about what led up to the event, right? Then you're going to walk through the event. See, and the reason why I I'm, I'm suggesting, recommending highly that you go to a professional, because oftentimes we tend to go to our religious leaders for resolve. And you can, you can say all day long, you know, let God do this and let God do that. I'm a strong believer in God, first and foremost. But I also know that I need to have some direction, right, from a professional who can get me on track, get me back on track, right, with where it is that I'm going because I'm off track for a reason. I need to be guided. 
You can't be rightly guided by God if you're not rightly guided inside for the path that you're going on because you will still travel that same path. You're going to always have God's presence in whatever situation, whether you're a believer or not. He watches over us all. But you have to also understand that you have to get some direction. Some direction that keeps you on path and in alignment with God. Right? And this is not a religious show. I'm not one of those holier-than-thou kind of people. But I, I believe I'm a believer. But I also know that I'm a believer as a clinician. I've been a clinician for years. Over 20 years I've been a clinician. So I also know the value of treatment. I've been through therapy myself because I also know the value of treatment. It's like that hair commercial. Um, I'm not just your president, I'm a customer or whatever it is. So, you know, he's got his hair through the same venue. But I'm just saying, I'm a believer in it, right? I have evidence. I've done research, you know, on human behavior. I continue to do research on human behavior. I continue to do those things, right? So when you, when you relive it over and over and over again, you relive it through your traumatic lens through your world view it won't improve for that very reason it won't improve especially if you're dealing with shame guilt humiliation embarrassment when you're dealing with all those things and you're trying to bring resolve to significant event, events traumatic events within yourself you're never going to have any resolve to it. I'm gonna tell you right now you will never bring resolve to what's happening within you until you see some professional direction. You can sit down and say all day long, I, well, I go to 12-step groups, you know, I go to the church, I go to the masjid, the, the synagogue, I go to that, and that's, that's helping me. And, and you, you keep telling yourself that over and over again because that's what you need to tell yourself. Because, to, you know, to, to face what's really happened or happening to you, right? Oh, that's difficult. That's the painful, that's the painful you know, um, a circumstance that you're avoiding. You're avoiding having conversation about that. You don't talk about it. When somebody else brings it up, you don't want to talk about it. It turns out, it turns out, out to be a big argument and a fight every time somebody intends, you know, attempts to talk about it with you. But those most closest to us see it. And you know what? So many of us lose, lose loving, healthy, beneficial, long-term uh, uh, relationships because we don't want to deal with our own stuff. And then we, and especially if you're with somebody, you know, who's about focusing on change, taking, always taking a look at themselves, always putting themselves out, on, out there, you know, always disclosing themselves. You know, somebody, you know, who's always open, you know, about their past about their course of action, about their struggles. When you have somebody in a relationship who is like that, and then you have someone who is opposite of that, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Because you got, you got, and again, you have some people who are like, they're, they call themselves spiritual. Well, spiritual doesn't negate significant traumatic events. You can say all day long, yeah, well, God got this. Yeah, but God, we know God got this, but what do you got? What part are you playing in bringing resolve to that condition? You know, they go through life and it's avoidant behavior. That's all it is. It's avoidant behavior. And some become religiously preoccupied and don't see how they're spiraling down, that they're spiraling quickly down that rabbit hole. That they keep going on and on and on and on and on. Next thing you know, they're down. Zoom, and they're in darkness. But they're still saying over and over again, God got this. I know God got me. But then you see the misery all over their faces. You see the misery all over their faces. Right? You see, you see it in their actions. They're just miserable. You ever see a person who just is just miserable all the time? Because they haven't brought resolve to the unresolved within their lives. Um, number six on that list, addiction and eating disorders in an attempt to escape or numb negative emotions. Now, 
again, this is something else that I, I, I talk about in a book, um, chemical dependency. Each and every one of us are chemically dependent. Every one of us. And every time I do a, a training on substance use disorders, chemical dependency, first thing I tell people is to look on the table in front of you. Look on the table in front of you, right? Not only look at, look, look at your lunch bag. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. What are you anticipating? Lunch. What is that? Chemical dependency. The only thing that is on your mind over and over again. It may be a great lecture. It may be a great movie. It may be a, a, a great presentation. What are you thinking of? When I can get that chemical. Because you're looking at, you're looking at, you're, 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 you have a preoccupation. Because you're thinking about satisfaction. What is that? That's the id. That's the id. Oh no, this is a great workshop. This is a great show that you're doing. When do we get lunch? Or they go and get some a cup of coffee, they go and get a glass of water, they go and get something. Look at your own behaviors. You have to look at yourself and see where you are chemically dependent. Now, the problem that happens when you have unresolved trauma is that you begin to use that particular chemical as a uh, emotional healing. So here you are, one o'clock in the morning, getting in your car, driving to Wawa's because you want to go get yourself some chocolate ice cream. Because you can't sleep. You're basking in self-pity and sorrow and, and all this. You just had a nightmare again, right? Um, or you're stressing over this relationship that you're in. And you're, you know, you see all the signs of why you need to get out of it, but you stay in it. But you stay in it, and then you go get the ice cream, and the ice cream makes you feel good because what it does is it satisfies the id because the id wants everything its way. So once you eat that chocolate ice cream, you're good. You know, you're sitting, you're rocking, you're feet and whatnot, so you feel good. And now that pain has been numbed, and you go slide back into the bed next to the very person, you know, who you're having this difficulty with. And in some cases, it really is them, right? But it always comes back to you because you can just make a decision instead of beating them down and making them feel bad about who they are. They have the right to be who they are. You have the right to be who you are, so make a decision. But for right now, that chocolate ice cream is taken away all of that. It's taken away all of that. So um, it's easy to talk about, you know, alcoholism, you know, we have this big opioid addiction, you know, that's happening. Um, and some of, some of this addiction, right, you know, when you got, uh, um, you looking at the, the impact of opioid addiction right now, it started out with pain pills. People wanting to feel better, people wanting to feel good, and then after a while you felt so good that you want to feel gooder than good. Right, and next thing you know, you're on it, and your mind, listen, this, I learned this back in 1994, the statement. The mind is so powerful that it can manufacture, listen, it can manufacture pain. It can manufacture. It's not even real. But the mind is so powerful that it makes you believe that you're in more pain than you really are. That's how powerful the mind is. That's how, more, that's how powerful the mind is. You don't believe me? Do some research on it. Do some research on what the mind can do. That whole mind over matter, if it don't matter, you don't mind kind of stuff. Listen, if the mind, if the mind has the ability to manufacture pain that is non-existent, what else do you think the mind can do? Just want you to think about that for a minute. And you don't have to believe anything I say. Do the research yourself. Do the research yourself. But when we look at uh, eating disorders, that's a whole other thing, you know, uh, because it goes back to self-perception, self-concept, right? Not only are you numbing the pain of significant events, but you're, you're also dealing with those things to the best of your ability. And you find, you know, many, uh, uh, not only becoming obese, but the eating disorder of uh, purging. You know, people don't want to gain 
you know, extra weight because they don't want to. They don't want to be fat. They don't want to. You know, they heard what 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 dad was saying to mom. You know about mom. You fat ass. This that and the other. And they hear it over and over again. And the child wants to protect that parent who is you know is being you know abused uh, by the other parent. Stop calling my mind fat. And, and in their mind now they be they become conditioned. You know that every time you know they look like they're gaining weight. Right? They yeah, they eat and they go throw up because they don't want to be fat. They don't want to be fat. Right? They don't want to purge their food either, but they don't want to be fat. Because they don't want to be they don't want it to be said to them. If you say that to my mother, you're gonna say that to me. And then if somebody in, in their classroom says to me, well, you're fat, what do you think that does to them? So now you have a, a, a disorder developing as a result of things that are learning, things that are conditioned within the individual. So there are a lot of things that are said to children that we have to be very careful of. And not only do we have to be very careful of what we say, we have to be very careful of what we do because it's also becoming reinforced. What we want to do is extinguish negative behaviors, negative self-perception, negative worldview. So that means that you have to recreate within the mind a positive structure. So that means as long as you continue to accept things and the child sees you accept things, the child is going to have that reinforced within them. But this whole opiate, opioid thing, man, you know, it's the opiate uh, uh, addiction has been around for a long time. Right? But when we have, when we look at, you know, we can go back to Marilyn Monroe. Right? We, we know the issues that Michael had, and we talked about Prince and Whitney Houston and, and you know, Bobby Christina. When we look at all these things, pain, man. You know, when you know that something can totally numb the pain, not just the physical pain, but the, the psychological pain, the spiritual pain. That Listen, that's what opioids are doing for people. Not doing to people, doing for people. It's numbing their pain. You can spend so much less by just going to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and getting help. You can spend so much less and do so much less damage to yourself if you just go and sit down and talk to a professional. Stop walking into these churches. Stop walking into the masjid. Stop walking into these synagogues. Stop walking into these places and let somebody put their hands on you bow down with you and all this and telling you that God's going to make it all right because he is but that means you have to do work too he's going he's got you he's not going we, we always hear that you know he's not going to put upon us more than we can bear even when it seems unbearable we'll get through it but getting through it you know there's another side to that because you have to take responsibility because he also helps those who help themselves. What are you doing to help yourself? What are you doing to help yourself? These are skilled people. I'm a skilled professional. I'm a credentialed professional. I'm a degree professional. And I'm a customer. I'm a customer. Right? First thing you do, as soon as you wake up, you've got, you got a chemical in hand. Think about it. Think about it. The, the, the body is made up of nothing but chemical. And I talk about this in my book, Why Are You My Ex? It's coming, y'all. It's coming. It's just so much information that, that must go into this book. That must go into this book, right? Um, but I talk about chemicals. Do you know... We're made up of like 97% of the earth, right? So just think about it for a minute. If you, uh, if you can understand that, if it doesn't rain, right, what happens when the heat comes? And we look at Southern California, right? But when you look outside and you see how everything has wilted up and it's dried up because it hasn't had water, that's the same thing that happens to the human being when you don't drink enough water. 
right? But there are other things that begin to happen with the, the organs, internal organs, right? When you don't have enough water. Um, there's other, uh, the, or not just organs, but your blood, right? Everything begins to happen when you don't have enough water, when you don't eat, uh, uh, have enough iron, when you don't have enough uh, potassium and all these things in your body. There's something that happens. So when you add additional chemicals, there's always going to be a reaction. Stress, right, is, is, is actually uh, a chemical reaction. And stress kills. Um, number seven, sleeping issues including trouble going to sleep or staying asleep. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that uh, I kind of cycle on uh, at about every 40, 45 days, I have these days of uh, insomnia. You know, where um, I have difficulty sleeping and staying asleep, you know, for days at a time. You know, I've learned how to manage that, where I don't get up, you know, I make sure there aren't any lights on. I sleep with uh, night lights, but, you know, I don't look in the direction of those things. I don't pick up my phone to see what time it is. Um, I have an alarm. I already know when the alarm goes off what time it is, you know, so I... I I don't turn on the television. I don't go and read anything, right? I have uh, soundscapes on my phone, so a lot of times I just focus on the soundscape. You know, I love rain. I love I love when it's pouring down rain, so I have that. And I have seascapes, obviously, because I love the ocean. But I have those things in place, so you know, when I do wake up, I just lay there and I focus on that, and it puts me right back to sleep. I drink valerian tea. Valerian. I get valerian root from uh, pen herbs, right? Um, I prefer to have the root as opposed to the capsules. Uh, it works for me. It stinks like a, a dickens. It smells up the spot. Um, and it's definitely not a taste that you, you can easily become accustomed to. But you can use flavor teas if you don't. But um, I use candles. I use, you know, aromatherapy, things like that. That's, ca that's called managing, managing, right, your symptoms. You manage those things. You learn how to manage. It's definitely not going to take sleeping pills. I know you know people who take sleeping pills and they take them, you know, uh, regularly just to go to sleep. You're not addressing the issue. If you're having trouble sleeping, there's an issue you need to get addressed. That is not. You can't address everything with medication. There are natural things here that can help you get restful sleep. Valerian helps you get restful sleep. So you need to look at natural things that can help you. But part of the naturalness is also, it goes along with psychotherapy. You need to have therapy along with those aids so that way you can learn how to manage uh, the area that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, falling asleep, anybody, anybody know me? I, listen, I, I'll eat and I'll be out. If you're not engaging me, I'll be knocked out about five minutes after I eat, right? Eight, eight o'clock, I'm sitting down scratching my head because it's, you know, I mean, if I have somebody here with me, that's something different, you know, but if I'm by myself, uh, I'm out. Eight o'clock, I'm, I'm like in that mode and I'm heading on up to, to, to get into the bed and I'm asleep, literally sleep before nine o'clock on most nights. Uh, so I have a problem falling asleep. Uh, but when I go through that period of insomnia, you know, um, it, it can be a difficult thing if you don't learn how to manage, you know, your, your symptoms. Um, number eight on that list, suffering from feelings of detachment or feeling dead inside. This is perhaps the most devastating of the signs because it creates a feeling of loneliness and isolation. Right, so I talked about number four, right? being a real big one, you know, on my list. Um, here on the list is talk about number eight is probably the most devastating because this leads to most cases suicide. Yeah, suicide. Um, because when people get in a space of loneliness and isolate I isolation, typically what happens is 
um, nothing else matters. You're, you're, you're just existing. And this also comes, comes on the heels of, of, of addictions too. When you look at substance abuse, right? Right, where people get to the point of uh, this here can do for me what nobody else can do and what nobody else has done, so I'll take more of this. Uh, alcoholism is formed in an, an isolative environment because you don't drink at the bar anymore, you don't be bothered all that, you just want to focus on the drink. So you drink. You just drink and drink and drink and drink and you sit and you watch television by yourself and then you live in this like kind of virtual world, but not a virtual world that you've created that is a positive one that helps you, you know, um, helps get those uh, uh, creative juices flowing. It's one that becomes darker and darker and darker. Where you go to work, you come home, you close the blinds, you might eat something, right? And then you're in the bed, and maybe not watching television, maybe not listening but to the radio, maybe you're just reading, but you just have this deadness inside. You know, you just don't want to do anything. And then after a while, that existence becomes like, listen, I'm, I'm done with this. Uh, um, and you know, well, we have a lot of people you know, you, when you, you meet somebody and they have a very flat affect, you know, in like normal circumstances where somebody would laugh, like aha, or they would be celebratory, not celebratory, celebratory, and then what happens is, you know, they just have a real flat affect, and, and it's not a diagnosed, or a diet, a diet it's not a diagnosis um, of, of a particular mental disorder, but it's just a matter of they're so, uh, desensitized uh, because of their loneliness and the, the, the uh, uh, unresolved that they have within themselves that they just, you know, they even love making, you know, uh, as pleasurable as it may be to them, it's still just a going through the motions kind of thing. Uh, and to <clears throat> But then the other part to that is uh, sometimes it can be reversed uh, into promiscuity. So that person can become very promiscuous because of the loneliness and start indulging in unhealthy relationships. You know, multiple one night stands or uh, situations where they're, maybe the person is abusive. You have all those kind of things that, you know, begin to happen. So it kind of, there's a, 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 another side to all of that. You know, there's a matter of, um, uh, you know, sexually uh, being detached by, you know, increased masturbation, spending a lot of time, you know, indulging with themselves, you know, and, and uh, those kind of behaviors, uh, which again begins to separate them more and more away from intimate relationships, not having the need for it because I'm satisfying self, so I don't need to, you know. So these are like compounded issues, and that, what, that's what people have to begin to realize is that we're not just talking about one significant event, we're talking about like overall, you know, things. Um, that are, they're compounded. These are things that just kind of build upon one another, one another, one another, one another. And before you know it, you know, you're going back to the whole bag lady, you know, um, uh, perspective is that you're carrying all this stuff. And it's not just bag lady, it's bag man, right? Because we got a lot of people who are just carrying a lot of stuff, unmanaged, unresolved stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> So let's see, we're, we're getting close to the hour. Uh, some work being done here um, at, the, uh, at the condo I live in. At the bathroom is being redone. Uh, slate floor is being put up. Uh, slate walling and new sink and new fixtures and all those things with that are being put in. 
Um, not that it was, it was it was needed to me. It looked great to me, but uh, the owner, uh, you know, wanted to have those things uh, upgraded. So I'm happy about it. Um, dissociation as a real disconnect in situations and conversations. Well, we really have to have, you know, when you start talking about dissociation, you're you're talking about uh, a whole different conversation that needs to be had, and maybe I can go into that at, uh, at a later time, so that way you can have an understanding of what it means to disassociate. You know, you just kind of like just disconnect from everything and everybody. Um, so what we'll do is, we're going to stop there today because uh, they're beginning to do the work here, um, and I'm not going to get up now and ask them to not hammer until in about 10 minutes because then I'm interrupting the show. So what we'll do is we'll, we're going we're gonna to stop here on dissociation because I want to continue the discussion on dissociation uh, next week. As always, uh, I'm thankful for all of you who tune in. Um, it's always a pleasure to do this because it helps me uh, a whole lot. It's not just about you know me just regurgitating things and um, it's about me, you know, using my profession, because I am a professional, right? Uh, about me using my profession, my understanding of human behavior and development, you know, uh, freely. This is this is therapy for you. I hope, you know, and that's the idea because we don't we don't want to enter into places. And I'm hoping that at some point you're watching these shows that you make a conscious decision to go get some help, and it's okay to need help. We got to get out of the mindset of, you know, I don't need help. I'm a man. I'm a woman. You might need to tell me this, that, and the other. Listen, at the end of the day, I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how successful you think you are. But none of that's not going to, none of that's going to matter. It's not going to matter if you don't take care of yourself. You know, part of healthy living is mind, body, and soul. Right? So those things aren't being worked on all at the same time because you can't work on one area and then you know work on the next you got to work on all of them at the same time right let somebody else help you even if that person who, who, who you're letting help you you're in a relationship with it's your husband your wife boyfriend girlfriend whatever people are calling themselves these days right let that person help you. see that's that that goes back to the whole concept of Adam and Eve and that that's, that's how my book begins. What was Adam's life like without the existence of Eve? Think about it for a minute. Just think about it for one minute. Then I want you to think about what was Adam's life like when Eve arrived. There's a lot to think about. Right? A whole lot to think about. Because all of this is significant. You know, we regurgitate all these scriptures and everything else, but we really don't understand mankind. And what we're already, what we're already intending to do, because we have free will. So when you have free will and you have an id, and it's not managed by the ego, the super ego, you got chaos on your hands anyway. Remember the first murder, Cain and Abel. Remember. Remember that. Remember that it already existed. Now we have events that take place that compound the complicatedness, the complexities of the human being. Folks, there's a lot that we need to cover. I'm going to do this until I can't do it no more. I thank you all for, for joining in. Uh, I appreciate your support. Uh, as always, um, it's been a great day. I'm getting ready to get dressed and head to the beach. Yo, for y'all, all y'all up north, I'm sorry, you know, that you, you know, you got all that that stuff outside that's freezing up the ground, that's making you slip, slide, and fall down. Uh, no, I'm not. Listen, uh, I'm here, Riviera Beach, Florida. I love it. I'm in it to win it. I'll see y'all next Sunday. Peace.